friends. Welcome back to Food Prep Guide. This is a follow-up video to our Meals in Jars series where we are going to take some of the meals that we have canned and show you how to cook them and complete them into complete meals. This is the venison meals that we did together, but just remember they can just as easily be beef. You can swap out the venison for beef one-to-one -one and not have to change anything else in these recipes. If you missed the original video for how we made these meals in jars, that will be linked in the description box below. One thing to note is that these meals, the way that I am cooking them up is to make this one quart jar of food stretch to feed either five people for supper or four people for lunch, me and three children for lunch. Um, in order in order to do that, we need to like kind of add certain things to make these stretch. So these are by no means gourmet or fancy meals. And I just wanted to point that out. These are frugal meal stretching recipe ideas. The other thing I wanted to note is many of you had questions about the texture of the meat. If it got tough and dried out being canned again using when I was using already canned venison chunks, the answer is no. They were just as tender and juicy as always. Last but not least, we've already cooked and enjoyed all these meals, so I go in ahead and included a scorecard after each recipe on a scale of 10 out of 10 so that you know um, how much we loved it or maybe how much we didn't like it so much. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and jump right into the meals. By the way, if you would like help building your food storage, scroll down to the description box of this video and click this link for our free one-year food storage plan. We calculated a year's supply of food for one person, then broke that data down into a week-by-week -week list of items to build your pantry on a budget. We'll send it straight to your inbox. If you're new here, we invite you to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss all of our upcoming food preservation, pantry storage, and gardening tutorials. Now back to the kitchen. The first meal we'll start with is the sloppy joe mix. Now I'm just going to pop this open and heat it up in a pot and you can absolutely just heat this up and toss it onto some slider buns or even just plain sandwich slices and just have sloppy joe sandwiches. But again, I'm just trying to make this stretch and we actually ended up getting two days worth of lunches out of this meal, making this meal overall extremely frugal. So we... In order to achieve um, the meal stretcher, we served this over elbow macaroni pasta. We could serve it over pretty much anything. It, it really reminded me of a chili mac. If you've ever had chili macaroni, um, it was like a sloppy joe mac. And um, everyone really enjoyed this. So it's going in our regular rotation. And I wrote down the recipe and I just named it sloppy joe mac. Um, and it just made an excellent, super quick lunch. Just have to heat up the sloppy joe jar and just have to cook up some pasta, which takes about 10 minutes. Um, and it really is that simple. So excellent, excellent lunch option. One thing that I don't see talked about enough when it comes to canning is how it's also meal prep. Um, you know, being able to cook this ahead of time, this meal in a jar ahead of time, it made lunch so, so easy. So yes, we're preserving food. Um, yes, we're doing, um, you know, just making food shelf stable and all that, but it's also meal prep. Um, and I just, I don't see that expressed enough. And it is one of the most amazing benefits of canning. Um, I, so went ahead and served this with just a dollop of sour cream because when my children are trying new things, I find that a little bit of sour cream helps it um, go over a little bit smoother. <laughs> so me and the kids loved it. My, my husband didn't absolutely adore it, so I rated it 7 out of 10. The next recipe is our Philly cheesesteak is what I called this. Of course, it doesn't have any cheese or anything like that in it, um, but we're just going to open the jar and again put it up in our pot and get it heated up. And we are going to, this is another one of those recipes where you could simply drain the liquid off and serve this on some hoagie buns, sandwich buns, top it with some sliced mozzarella and, you know, call it a day. But again, we're stretching. I decided to go ahead and add a half pint jar of some extra peppers. I felt like it didn't have enough peppers in it. And since this is a Philly cheesesteak, the peppers are kind of, they're kind of really important to me. Like a Philly cheesesteak is beef and peppers. <laughs> Um, so, and of course, this has onions in it and flavored with Worcestershire sauce and all those yummy flavors. Um, so, all of that was really good, too. But basically, we just need to bring the mixture to a boil. Go ahead and preheat our oven to 375 degrees Fahrenheit because what we're going to do is turn this into a casserole. I'm calling this Philly cheesesteak casserole. And in order to stretch this, we're going to add two quart jars of potatoes 
to the bottom of our dish. I went ahead and took the liquid out of one jar, but I want to keep some of that liquid in there because we're going to basically mash up these potatoes. I wouldn't necessarily call this true mashed potatoes, but it's a very quick lazy man's version of mashed potatoes. I have this really tall pot here because we're going to use the immersion blender in a minute and just having a pot with high sides uh, really cuts down on the mess of the immersion blender splattering. But anytime that I want some really quick mashed potatoes, and I don't necessarily want to use the instant potato flakes, which sometimes I do, but if I just don't want to use those, I, this is how I will prepare them. I'll put them in a tall pan, get my immersion blender out, and just go ahead and start blending up. It doesn't take too terribly long, and I'm not worried about them being extremely smooth, but I'm just basically getting a nice mashed potato type consistency. Now you have a lot of options here for stretching this meal into a casserole. Um, let's say you're not a huge fan of white potatoes. You could do like a sweet potato mash in the bottom of your of your pan. That would be really good as well. Or instead of turning it into a casserole, you can do a Philly cheesesteak pasta just like we did with our sloppy joe mix. You can even pour this over some rice and make it a Philly cheesesteak rice bowl. Um, there's just really a lot of options to play around with with these recipes. If you can just pair it with some sort of basically like a starch, um, you can make that meal stretch a whole lot further than just eating only the contents of the jar and nothing else. Once the potatoes are mashed to your liking, just dump them out into your casserole dish. This is a 9 by 13 pan, which was the perfect size for two quarts of potatoes, plus our meal in a jar mix. Um, you could switch this around and do the beef on the bottom layer and then have your mashed potatoes be the top layer. Um, either way, the flavor is going to be the same. It's just depending on whatever your personal preferences are. I'm just trying to smooth it out with a spatula before we go through and add in our um, Philly cheesesteak blend. We just need to bring this to a little bit boil. You can see that we are at that point, so it's ready to go into our casserole dish. I'm just going to pour a little bit of the juice um, as evenly as possible over the whole casserole before I start putting in the solids, um, so you can see what I or why I did that. And then the other kind of tip that I wanted to give you is that when you are spreading out the Philly filling over the casserole dish, go ahead and take either your spatula or a fork or something and start poking holes throughout the casserole dish like you see me doing here. And what that will do is it will create little air pockets for all of those liquids and all that really flavorful juice to kind of go down into the potatoes and just make it a whole lot more flavorful. I chose to top this dish with a mozzarella provolone shredded cheese blend. If I had just mozzarella slices, I would much have preferred to use that. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I didn't have those. And actually, now that we have already eaten this, I will tell you that I would have left off that cheese layer, which is very rare for me to say. And we are a cheese loving family and we, you know, top a whole lot of stuff with cheese. But for whatever reason, the cheese was really overpowering in this casserole dish. So when we make it again, which we will, we're going to leave out that cheese because it honestly would have tasted a lot better without it. After that, it's just going to go into the oven for 20 minutes. And here is what it looks like. It looks absolutely delicious. Just baking it until the cheese is golden brown. Took about 20 minutes for us. But like I said, next time we make it, we will leave off the cheese layer. I gave this score a 6 out of 10 because um, the children were complaining about the, uh, the flavor of the cheese and how it's just really kind of an odd flavor. And I agreed. Okay, this next recipe is our taco venison. So we are going to stay true to its name and make this into tacos. There are a bajillion and one ways that you can do this, um, but basically I was having a hard time opening that with one hand. I'm holding the camera with one hand, trying to open it with the other. Um, but we're just going to start out the same way, which is get this into the pot and bring it to a boil. That's pretty much how we're starting with almost all of these meals and jars is just bringing that jar to a boil before moving on with our other steps. Again, um, I'm trying to feed as many people as possible, so we need to add something to this. So I'm going to be doing a Spanish rice. There's lots of different ways to make Spanish rice. This is how I make a quick version of Spanish rice. I have one cup of white rice that was rinsed thoroughly and two cups or one pint of water. And then we're going to bring in our flavorings. I don't measure a whole lot with these, but I'm using my freeze-dried bell peppers. I have used just regular dehydrated bell peppers for this as well. I try to kind of crush it a little bit 
And I would say, if I had to guess, I would say about one to two tablespoons of that. And then the tomato powder. This is the key to making a really quick and easy Spanish rice mix. And one of the reasons why I love keeping tomato powder on hand. Um, but I put two tablespoons of tomato powder in here. And you're about to see me add salt. And I had an oopsie. <laughs> I am so used to, un, um, to taking the lid off of my salt for these canning videos. Because I need to scoop it out. And I took the lid off instead of sprinkling it. So what I did to remedy this... <laughs> was I cooked up some extra white rice so that I could kind of cut that saltiness if needed. Um, and I only ended up having to add about a half a cup of white rice to the end to make up for the extra salt that I put into that mix. But in general, you only need half a teaspoon of salt um, to, to get this Spanish rice seasoned just right. And then I added just a sprinkle of black pepper. I would say about a quarter of a teaspoon total. And then we just mix that around just enough to get everything um, incorporated and to get those chunks of tomato powder kind of broken up. Um, just like you would make any kind of rice, that's the instructions you would use for this rice, which is just put a lid on it and bring it up to a boil. Once it's boiling, I lower down the heat to a very low simmer, put the lid on, and usually do it for about 10 minutes. Sometimes I need to go longer for 15 minutes. It just depends. Sometimes I'll need to add a teeny tiny little bit more water, but um, you just, you know the texture that cooked rice needs. So that's what we're achieving. The mixture was done by the time that the rice was done and we were ready to top our tacos. Um, we use sour cream in pretty much all of our tacos, but you can top your taco however you like. This is just how we do it. I spread the sour cream on the bottom because um, it's really easy for that sour cream to plop off the back. <laughs> and that was actually a tip that my husband gave me a long time ago. He's like, why don't you spread the sour cream on first and then put your toppings on? I'm like, genius. <laughs> so that's how we've done it ever since. But just put a little, um, little scoop of the Spanish rice down first and then top it off with our venison taco meat. We love topping this with sliced avocado if it happens to be on sale. If we happen to have some fresh cilantro coming in from the garden, we love to um, garnish the tacos with some chopped cilantro as well. Um, but it's not in season right now, so we don't have any. So it's just sour cream, rice, mix, and cheese. And of course, it's a taco. So it scored a 10 out of 10. We are a taco-loving family. Y'all have heard me say that before. 10 out of 10, no brainer. Um, this goes into our regular rotation for sure. Okay, next meal is going to be our chipotle beef. We're going to get started by cooking up a rice dish. This is our beefy rice mix that we prepped together in another video. Just dump the whole jar of mix in there and then add an equal pint of water. And then I always like to do about a tablespoon of butter and I cook in my pressure cooker. I'm just um, getting it all around, kind of getting all those spices nice and mixed around. And then I will move forward with the cooking process, but you can absolutely do this on a stovetop as well. If you do it on a stovetop, be sure to um, use double the amount of water that we did. You would want to use two pints of water instead of one. Make sure it's sealed to airtight, and we are going to pressure cook this for eight minutes. While that's pressure cooking, we can go ahead and get our main dish heated up, which is the chipotle beef. Again, all we need to do is dump it into a pot and bring it to a boil. This is truly one of the main benefits of having meals in jars. I've tried to communicate this, the absolute convenience of it when we redid the original meal in jars mix, but I think now that we're cooking it up to meals, um, it just illustrates that beautifully about how easy it makes meal times come together. So after eight minutes, the rice is cooked to perfection. I'm just fluffing it with a fork and it's ready to serve. Supper was ready to serve within what? maybe 10 minutes. I had to give some time for the pressure cooker to come down, release. I did the natural release on that rice, by the way. Um, and then I'm just basically making this a rice bowl. So I'm serving that beefy rice on the bottom and then topping it with the chipotle beef. So the chipotle obviously is spicy, but remember we only put one chipotle pepper in that whole quart jar. Out of the five of us, only one of us, which was my youngest son, who said it was too spicy. So four out of five of us, and we're not a spicy loving family. Um, we're very conservative when it comes to spiciness. And so the fact that four out of five of us loved this meal um, tells you that it's not too terribly spicy. But my youngest did struggle a little bit with the spiciness. 
Um, so I just wanted to mention that we ended up, I ended up scooping a little bit of that extra juice without the solids just to kind of give even more flavor to that rice. Um, and, um, this is, this is an excellent, excellent meal. I scored it a nine out of 10 because four out of five of us loved it. And even the little one, um, a dollop of sour cream helped cut that spiciness and he ended up really enjoying it as well. Okay, next recipe is our pot pie filling, and we are going to do what I call a lazy man's pot pie. Again, we're just going to dump the jar into a pot and bring it to a boil. Do you see a theme here? <laughs> Quick and easy. Um, but basically what we're going to do is make a shortcut version of a roux to thicken up this basically, um, it's basically like a soup base. Um, but we need to preheat our oven to 375 degrees Fahrenheit and put a quarter cup, uh, or excuse me, half a stick of butter in a soft saucepan and get that melting. Add a quarter cup of flour and get that all mixed around really well. I noticed that that quarter cup of flour, my butter was still a little bit thin. So I wanted to go ahead and add some more. That's visually, you'll see in just a minute what we're trying to achieve. But normally with a roux, you add some liquid like a milk. But we have all of that liquid in our pot pie filling. So we're not gonna add any liquid to this in order to make our pot pie filling go from a really liquidy state to a thick and creamy state. So I did end up adding about an eighth of a cup more of flour in order to get this almost like a butter paste, which is going to thicken up our pot pie filling beautifully. Um, so yes, it's a whole lot thicker than your average roux, um, but we're going to be taking advantage of all of that liquid in our pot pie filling. Once it gets to this thick butter paste stage, we're done. We can go ahead and turn the heat off, go ahead and remove it from heat so it doesn't burn, and go ahead and even plop it into your pot. You can see here, now I just take a whisk and whisk it around, and as I whisk, you can literally watch the mixture thicken as I'm stirring, which is kind of fun. I love that. <laughs> um, but you can see it turn into a beautiful pot pie filling consistency. You could even, this would even be a great beef stew, honestly. As I, When I was cooking this, and then when I tasted it, and it, is, it scored a 10 out of 10, uh, spoiler alert, <laughs> I was like, wow, this can be used for so many different things. You're talking shepherd's pie, beef stew, uh, a full-fledged full pot pie with pie crust. Um, it can just be used for so many things. A pot pie pasta. Um, I mean, it's great. So I turned the heat off. We're done at this point. We're now our lazy man's um, pot pie topping. Now... I made a mistake here. I was supposed to use my buttermilk pancake mix that we make homemade. Um, and I had it just, I had it on the counter just off screen here, but I also had my flour container on the counter getting, uh, making the roux. And I grabbed it instead of my buttermilk pancake mix. So this is basically we need two and one fourths cup of either Bisquick or a pancake mix. And then go ahead to that and add two cups of water and then we're just going to whisk it and stir it with a whisk until all those big clumps are softened and everything is, the flour is incorporated into the water really well um it actually didn't turn out too bad this was literally just flour and water so it did have a gluey kind of texture which you will kind of see that at the end product um but the buttermilk pancake mix is oh it is so good um so i'm kind of kicking myself for <laughs> for that mistake but everyone enjoyed it and even went back for seconds even with it just being a flour and water mixture so here is our we're just putting it into our pan putting the beef mixture down on the bottom and then topping that with our breading mixture i call this the lazy man's pot pie because of how i use my pancake mix but I will sometimes do pie crust for this and do a true pot pie. Or uh, probably more often, I will simply place biscuits on top of the casserole. I will just um, fill up the pan with biscuits. And basically, everyone gets one biscuit and two scoops of the kind of creamy base part as part of their meal. Um, but basically, we're just spreading out this batter, making it nice and even, and then it is going to go into the oven. This is the this is not a nine by thirteen. I don't remember if I mentioned that. It's the step down. I don't remember what the sizing is. I think I don't even want to say what size it is because I really don't remember. But it's the step down from nine by thirteen. Okay, this needs to bake in the oven for twenty five minutes. And here is how it looked. Like I said, the crust does not normally look like that. I just made that mistake, but it was still actually really good. I'm going to um, kind of go into it and show you what the bottom layer looks like. It gets nice and bubbly and kind of thickens up even more in the cooking and the baking process. 
Um, but this was a winner. It is going into our regular rotation, 10 out of 10, um, and it can just be turned into so much. That's all for today. I hope you all enjoyed. We'll see you next time. Bye.